All right, everybody, welcome back to another edition of the Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. I am excited, as is Craig. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To have um, a little bit different spin for you today. So we had a gentleman by the name of Kevin Reardon, soon to be doctor in the year 2020, reach out to us and had some great questions and just, you could already tell he was a hustler and he's a third year dental student. He's in a third year at Creighton in uh, Omaha and um, was really excited about just even the tone and the pros of, of, the, of, his, of his writing. And I was like, you know what, you need to come on and why don't you ask us some questions? Let's flip the script as opposed to us interviewing you. Why don't you interview us as people who have been in the career in, in the space for 20 years? Like what's the messaging and the narrative that you're hearing? And why don't you ask us questions in that context? And so Kevin, I think, uh, I think you were, you, you jumped at the chance or I made you jump at the chance. Yeah, no, and, absolutely. I'm uh, we're excited to have you on pal. Thanks for, Hey, thanks for wearing a tie by the way. Oh, this yeah. is our, this is our, this is our dress code. We got to wear this every day at Creighton. Oh, do you really? Yeah. Wow. I would have not have done well at, <laughs> from the dress <laughs> code alone. You could have worn the same tie every day, Peter. You'd have been fine. This is true. Like and I do nice clip ons too. And Kevin, I just want to acknowledge you for that awesome email you sent us. That was just really heartfelt. And um, the way you uh, spoke, um, Pete and I were both really fired up. Because listen, at the end of the day, the reason why we do this is to um, help inspire other people. So um, that's validation for us. So it's an honor to have and you. And especially, I thought even more so for, for you know, people, you know, guys and gals in school. Not even, maybe not even more so, but I'm glad it's penetrating even there. Because as before we hit record, I was telling Craig and Kevin that, you know, school's a daunting place, one of which I almost quit uh, because because things were made so kind of difficult or bleak. You know, the outcome was going to be so bleak for me or whatever. I almost quit. Um, and so I think it's nice to, to be a beacon of hope and, and tell you the way that the real shit goes on yeah. in, in the world, um, world of dentistry, not not this doom and gloom that it was presented to me like when I was yeah. in school. So. <laughs> Fired up, man. Uh, I know you can't, I can tell just by your, your, I can tell you came prepared and ready to roll with some questions. So you're going to be the voice of, uh, you're going to be speaking as the proxy on behalf of every dude dental student in, uh, in America right now. So no pressure. Absolutely no pressure though. No pressure. Yeah, none, none whatsoever. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, I just get, um, you know, being a dental student, everyone kind of, I feel like goes down that same path and, you know, your professors and just the, uh, especially the online forums are, are just the worst about painting this, this path of doom and gloom that essentially, you know, you've just got to go do this and you got to go and network with every insurance and this is just the way of the world and you got to do this and that and fire this person and fire that person. Mm -hmm. And I, I always just like rejected that in the back of my mind. But then, you know, I found this podcast and I found you guys just like you guys talking about uh, you know, the future of dentistry and, and, and how things can be different and just how you both shaken it up in your own way and, and really just kind of challenge the status quo that got me to be like, wow, okay, maybe there's a chance that we're not getting the real story on, on what's possible in dentistry. And that just got my mind whirling. And, and yeah, I reached out to let you guys know, I'm uh, just interested to, you know, I figure however I could uh, get around you guys would be a, would be a benefit to me. And, and if you're going to answer some questions, even better. Nice. Nice. I love yeah. You're not getting the full story in dental school. Um, I was lucky enough to have my dad, but uh, I just remembered how some of them, you know, listen, good, the good professors are transformational for us, but the bad ones, um, they leave a mark too. And yeah. I had many uh, experience. I remember this one experience just to bring back the, I guess the tone and the culture of my school at that time. I had this professor I had worked on something so long. I can't remember what the hell it was like a wax up or something like that, but I was like holding it so carefully. I didn't want to like breathe on it. And I brought it over to this professor in Prost. I can't even remember his name, but he was, he looked at, it, he's like, Hey, you look like you're scared when I'm holding this. I'm like, well, it's like represents like 30 hours of work, work man. You know, and he starts throwing it up in the air and catching it, throwing it up in the air and catching it. I got so like, I had a panic attack and he's like, is that making you nervous? I'm like, you know, it's honestly, it's making me nervous for you. Cause God forbid you drop that. I don't think I'll be able to control myself. from like yeah. tearing you apart. Yeah. And I, I meant it. It wasn't a threat. I was just like, I, I'll be enraged if you drop it. And it was just this culture of hazing. I mean, maybe it's different now. And, and obviously I had a lot of great guys, but there were those guys in there that couldn't make it on their own or whatever it was, but they sought significance in their role as a professor. And there's two ways to make yourself feel great. Either, 
do it by being great or tear other people down around you. And I just remember those professors that were interested in tearing us down and that really irked me. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you ever had something like that, Peter. Yeah. But. Oh. yeah I, well, yeah, I did not, you know, luckily I, I found, um, I didn't have those kind of stories, but, but definitely had somewhere. I'm a lot older than you. It was like back in the day. My my dental school is in black and white. Well, and you, you? Had, you had those ham pieces you had to actually spin too by yourself. Yeah, well, it was a, we had hamster power towards the end of it, you know, uh-huh. went in hamster, like gerbil power. And gold had just been kind of was new to the scene at that point. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Well, my professor G.V. Black once told me, um, <laughs> if you can, <laughs> Kevin's not even laughing at because he's like, what the <laughs> are you talking about? You don't even know what G.V. Black You guys is. ought to hear about this plastic stuff they got called composite. It's going to blow your mind. Oh my God, Kevin! Have you ever heard? In, st- does it come in silver color? Because I'll love it. It'll match everything I do if it if it's metal colored. Yeah. yeah, Kevin, have you heard of GV Black? I'm wondering why you didn't. Yeah, laugh. no, we, they still they still oh, teach him. You know. All right, all right, cool. All right, man. So let's uh, let's roll. What you got? What you got? Yeah, so definitely number one, and and again, thank you for giving me the mic for all of all of every dental student. I'm sure I'm gonna uh, adequately represent their needs and wants, but. Uh, the number one thing at every question, the first thing people always ask is about student loans. And part of it is because it's a disgusting number that we're all basically required to take out. Um, but then also just kind of everyone preying on that and, and just amplifying it a million times of like, oh, you, you better, you got to go do this or that or work for corporate or pay this down or that down. And um, I personally feel like it's, it's, there's no blanket answer and, and it's basically just like, what are your career goals and, and how are you going to set yourself up? But I don't know. Um, again, that's where I was going back of, you know, I'm not the authority to give any of my classmates answers legitimately about that. My kind of cop out answer is that I'm just going to hopefully make so much money that it doesn't matter. But I guess that doesn't really get to the issue of, of how we should be approaching that. Well, so I look what, at what is the average? Like, what do you hear? The average is about 275,000, 265,000, but, that's dragged down by a lot of zeros of people that don't have any, any, any debt. You know, most of so, most people like Creighton are three, 375, 400. That let's level. use 400 because I hear that number a lot. So what do you think you make as a first year? What have you heard you make as a first year um, graduate? What do, what do you think you can expect to make? Because I'm just going uh, I mean, to th- th- Yeah, I mean, I think that you can make a little bit more money in, pre- in uh, going to a DSO right away. And they're throwing out numbers anywhere from like 120 to 150. Um, and then I've heard in private practice, uh, you could get associates that associateships that'll pay as low as like eighty thousand dollars. But then on top of that, there's also the higher end if you really can produce um, that, you know, around two hundred thousand. Like- yes. So, do you know what it takes to make? Do you know what level of dentistry you need to produce in order to take home two hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, I mean, if you're getting uh, well, if you're getting, you know, twenty four percent at uh, okay. you know, Heartland or whatever, you got to do a, a hell of a lot of dentistry. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's, so. so let's go back to your, uh, I want, I want to make sure we stay on task of his question. So the, the, the overarching conversation you're saying, number one is, is fear of debt, right? You've got this debt, but you know, like Craig said, it's kind of the average is let's just call it 400,000. I just did the math by the way, Pete. 0.33. So. So check it out. So everything's just an ROI. So I think people look at debt and all debt is not created equal. And you can't just say debt is bad because if debt is performing, then you, you've made a good business decision. So um, your debt, at, let's just say 400,000, I took 135 as a first year salary. So if you can make 135 because you spent 400, that's a 33% return on the money. So even if you're five, seven, eight percent um, cost uh, of, of the money or the interest rate, it still performs and your debt will go away. They can't, once your debt is paid off, the knowledge is still there for you. So um, I think, you know, what you're learning in dental school is you're, you're buying your, your education, of course, but you're buying your ability to practice. And that's something that no matter what uh, economic conditions or no matter where you live in the United States, you have that skill. There's not too many other people that can take their skill with them and easily apply it anywhere they want. So I think you're buying just f- security in your future ability to work. Pete, you were jumping to say something? Well, you're buying what's called the barrier to entry, right? So imagine you're just buying a $400,000 ticket that allows you to get into a space that 
that like Craig said, has, has the means of no limit, no ceiling. And you're pretty much guaranteed $120,000 a year. Now, doesn't seem a lot in the context, $120,000 a year doesn't seem a lot in the context of $400,000 debt. Right. But it's a great um, ROI because $400,000 parked at 5% of interest would yield you 20,000 a year. Right. So the fastest way, you know, the, the, don't let, I guess my advice would be don't let debt scare you. It's just part of the process. You know, don't go crazy. Like, like I did in dental school, like buying motorcycles and stuff that should not That's I funny. I, I, I did the same actually. Yeah, well. dude, I, I literally maxed out my student loans, but you know what I maxed out to 160, 170, I think. <laughs> You know, and I was like blowing and going. I was living high on the hog for some reason. I don't know what I thought. Um, yeah. I mean, high on the hog for a student. But yeah, ramen only once a week instead of five times a week. Right, right. But Kevin, I, I, I want to make sure I, we, I, we, we answer the question. Um, yeah, so then are you, are you, are you saying, you know, you're, you're living it up in dental school and you're going to pay it back. So are you, are you a proponent of paying it back? Look, let me, let me put it this way. Yeah. In, in, yes, I am a proponent of that. But let me put it this way. If you told me in hindsight right now that it would cost $400,000 to get my education, I'd have been like, okay, like versus yeah. 160, 170, it doesn't matter. It's immaterial. It's it literally. So when you have some, some runway and some perspective looking back, it's like, it's, it's not going to matter. You know, I'm not saying it doesn't matter to pay it back. Um, and I do like your methodology about if you can live like a student a few years after you've graduated, I know it sucks to even say that because you go through such a shitty period of those four, four years. The last thing you want to do is continue living like that. Once you've gotten, once you've bought this ticket of graduation, but if you can, if you can exercise a little bit of caution, just stay lean and, and redeploy as much as your earnings back into that debt, then that would be smart. Well, I mean, listen, there's, we got to look at debt in a, in a larger term as well. What, what's your, what are you, what's your rate fixed at, Kevin? Do you know? I mean, it's about like five ish. So at five percent, it's it's pretty cheap money historically speaking. So yeah, the debt, but Craig, the debt service alone on five on four hundred thousand dollars. Well, let's do the math. What's what's the twenty thousand dollars a year? One more time. Twenty thousand dollars a year. No, it's probably more than that. Well, at five percent times four hundred. No, I know, but there's principal as well. You're just talking about the interest. No, no, no. The, I'm saying just the debt, sir. Right. So I'm saying well, the, not debt service. Just saying the 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 interest cost. The interest right. alone. Thank you. Yeah, yeah debt service is the whole. So yeah, so twenty thousand dollars a year, but that's still. I mean, I think the moral of the story is don't. It can break your balls and and crush your spirit to say that this debt is so huge, but Pete and I have you know debt on uh, land and stuff like that. Man, I'm I'd be sleeping a lot easier yeah, with you just get higher quality debt problems yeah. right like we both have debt i mean i would love to have 400 only four hundred thousand dollars. oh my god yeah right yeah um i, I take i'd be happy with five times that but it's right. not and and that's that's the thing is then I, like you said that's like pretty cheap money and i feel like it's probably best um you know barring barring the debt being a reason i can't get a loan which I, from what i've heard that wouldn't be a huge problem for the long term uh, keeping it around at 5% isn't the end of the world. I mean, if it's like you said, you wish you had $400,000 and 5% is not the worst rate. Um, I feel like if I can invest in something like another practice, like what kind of ROI am I going to get from that? Or can I beat 5% if I buy a second practice? Like those Absolutely. Kind of Absolutely. It's the arbitrage yeah. of your money. Exactly. It's what always going to be, don't let it be an emotional decision. Like all financial things, it has to be a numbers-based decision. But the problem is we let our, we let our, our heart govern you know, our, the conversations around money and that's where everybody gets in trouble. Money is actually more emotional than, than anything else. It, it always has to be a logical conversation. And I hope the narrative isn't that like, oh, you have to go corporate now because your debt levels are so high. I so hope I, that's not, not the nothing. Let me tell you, like we, like I, personally at Creighton, which um, I, I have, I love Creighton. I love the school, but um, we have these lunch and learns of these DSOs. We're stat, fed this steady diet of, Pizza Hut and just fear mongering from these DSOs. And I mean, you know, I walk out of these things and I'm like, I can't believe that they're trying to sell us on 24% collections minus lab costs. And then I hear, you know, people two, two behind me like, oh, well, yeah, it's 24%. This one, that, that last one was better. They, they said 26%. And I'm Wait, like, who, I have a question for you and I don't want to yeah. get you, I don't want to get you stuck here, but who is putting these on? So how is it, how is so, it that the DSOs, DSOs lunch and learns? So the no, DSOs know, but, will pay money. They'll pay money to the school on top of lunch. They'll buy lunch and give 
uh, for the most part, it's ASDA, uh, Academy of LDS, Dennis does some, um, really just, just student organizations. They'll pay money to show up. Because they have to. That's the business model. The attrition of their doctors is usually is so high in the ecosystems they've created that they have to have this intense onboarding or else the business model. No, I'm just surprised that they're, uh, I'll, I don't use the word allowed because I'm sure there's, it's, it's, but how is it sanctioned or condoned by the university? It just, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, I get that. And it's, it's there. Like, I mean, there are other, like other options sort of there. And we have this, uh, you know, this little link and you can see all the private practice opportunities from Creighton alumni and, and, and all that. Um, but these people are paying so much money to see us. And for them, a lot of it at the beginning, it kind of seemed like people were like, not, not buying into it, but the more you hear it, you're just going to kind of get beat down. And you're just, oh, yeah. it's like, like any oh, advertising I'm, message. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Once you heard it's it 30 a, times and now all of a sudden you're like, Hmm, sounds pretty good. They just need a good jingle. Yeah. And I that, mean, that, yes, ding, ding. But look, 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 I don't look, I want to do something quickly and not, I'm not poo pooing on corporate because I think it's a great place to go learn your skill set. I just don't want it to be the, the, I just don't want them to present it as the only option because it's not the only option. You know, yeah, so it's a, it's a good option and somewhere to go flex your muscle, learn some skill, like, you know, and, like, and, and it might be a good option for someone long-term. Long-term, well. like, exactly. You know, Pete and I talk about this all the time it, you, in dentistry. You need to have the perfect trifecta just to be a good dentist. You need to, you need to have, you know, skill obviously to do the physical work. You need to have diagnostic skill, which is totally different. And you need to build rapport enough for people to trust you. And then on top of all that, to be that trifecta of a great dentist, now, if you own your own practice, you need to be a sound business operator. And that's really rare and not for everyone. Kevin, one thing else to point out too, is that you need to make sure that, that your classmates are comparing apples to apples. The, uh, the job opportunity of corporate is going to be a five day a week job. It's going to be more than 40 hours, more than likely. It's not an apples to apples comparison. There's going to be a lot more sweat equity. Um, there's going to be a lot right. more. I, I, and, and those are the things, believe it or not, they're not, they're not really telling you that. And I try to, I mean, my classmates, uh, uh, they give me, they give me shit. They'll be like, because I asked these pointed questions following up like, Oh, that's great. So uh, what's like the turnover rate for, for those new dentists that you hire? And like, Oh, we don't have those numbers. And they yeah. talk about like, Oh, but you have the opportunity to be an owner dentist. And it's like, I, okay, what percentage of dentists that you have are owner dentists? Like, Ooh, we don't know that, but it's, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot. And I'm like, turns out it's only one in 11. So you know, it's just, they're not telling the whole story and it's hard to just kind of read through that. And then not only just to read through, all right, is this company legit? But then you become laser focused on like, like, like Dr. Smodak, you said, um, you know, you don't want that to be the only option. Well, when, when there's just more coming and more coming and more coming, you yeah. just become laser focused on it. And it's just like, I don't want to just say, Hey, look out the window. Like there's other, there's other things outside that we can. <clears throat> there is, but I don't want to shame. I don't want to shame the listener to thinking that being a, being a long time um, associate in a DSO is necessarily. Any totally. It, there's a place for everyone. There Absolutely. really is. Pete and I just did a podcast and it was, just, I mean, we didn't have the DSO alternative. We didn't really have that or the DSOs that were around when we were. Yeah. I had chains that were, yeah. were trying. I was going to like I, the chain dentistry. I know, but you didn't have the sophisticated operator of let's say like a Heartland or an Aspen no. that would actually send you to get more training and invest in you. And I mean, no. obviously the strings attached, but there is a space for that. And at the end of the day, you know, if I could take my book of business, we were just talking about this earlier today. If I could, if someone wanted to build what I built, you know, 10 years ago and said, Hey, listen, this is my plan. I'm going to build this, you know, big, big old, you know, a dental hospital. It's going to be all these specialists and there's going to be an amazing lab in there. And I want you to join with me and I'm going to pay you X percentage. That would have been a compelling thing for me to do. I would have entertained that. I don't necessarily need to be, be the captain of my destiny. I just need to find someone who shares my vision and work with them. Mm -hmm. And let's all face it now. We're, we're talking about, we always talk about DSO 1.0, 2.0. Um, and in the hotel space that would be equated to like the Motel 8 days in and, you know, uh, La Quinta, but there's new DSOs that are coming down the pipe here that are going to be like St. Regis and Ritz Carlton. And if St. Regis had a DSO, what we like to call DSO 3.0, sign my ass up. You know, I go to Ritz Carlton, I'm like, damn, this has run really well. The Ritz Carlton's run a lot better than Pete's and my dental practices. I mean, they, they check in 400 people and they know everybody's name. I mean, it's pretty darn amazing. Let's not go down the rabbit hole. Well, I did because I just want to make sure that people know and the dentists that are listening, there's no shame. And, and you're saying, Pete, like, this is a great place for you to polish up your skills, flex your muscle and, and bolt. 
there's but i guess the question too was is, is the, the debt is daunting and in summation kevin the, quick, the quickest way the quickest way out of debt is is product you know yeah i feel like you're saying there's there's three different things there's the people who are going to go straight to ownership and then peter you're saying that there's the people who will go into ownership eventually but they're not quite ready so they're going to use that as a stepping stone mm -hmm. and then next product you're saying there's there's another group that's um saying that there's that they're just going to stay there long term and, and none of them are any better than the other one. There's just three different options and three different ways of looking at it. I personally feel like that's, I agree that there are some people that that's great for them and the DSO is a great fit, but from where I'm standing and, and what I hear is available options, I just feel like there has to be a better way. There has to be a better DSO offering to a new grad to keep me around long term. Like it, it doesn't seem like it makes any sense. And if, if it's in the DSOs, then it's there or otherwise there's got, there's a huge, huge disconnect between private practice opportunities and, and, and new grads that want to get into private practice, but have no idea who, if you don't have a, a dad and like my dad's a dentist, I have a connection there. I have cousins that are dentists. If you don't have that connection, you literally have no idea. the deal. Like mm -hmm. I'm sending out a mailer in the Western suburbs, it's 200 dentists to find at Western suburbs of Chicago where I'm from to, to find <laughs> another practice. My dad doesn't want to retire right after I graduate. So I'll work. Why don't you join your dad? I'm going to, I'm going to work for him part time, but he doesn't, he won't have full time for me. So I'm going to, uh, and then my older brother actually is a year behind me in dental school. He's a D2. So, uh, he's definitely not going to have room for the three of us. So I'm going to, I'm trying to buy a practice right now. And again, I guess basically just what I'm getting at is, uh, I, I feel like I've had to do so much work to find about, these opportunities. Kevin, a, what about buying like a, your, your father's competitor and then doing a merger acquisition? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, so, I think you should roll this all, all the three of you under one roof. That yeah, that's, be... that's, 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 that's what I'm trying to do. Um, that's, I target it pretty, pretty specifically to like within a, a few mile radius of, but don't of his practice. Know it's, you know, but if you start sending letters with your last name, like you need to have a proxy or, or someone acting yeah. on your behalf. Cause if they see your last name, obviously, um, well, right. we just, we went super tactical really quick. Um, but Okay, let's go. Let's, let's like I said, uh, just there's that I'm getting at is there, there's the disconnect between private practice opportunities and new dentists and either there's got to be, I feel like, and, and you guys, I'd love to hear your take. I mean, this is kind of the stuff you talk about on this podcast all the time, but it's either got to be a better connection and a better, you know, meeting between the interface between private practice opportunities and new grads or just a better offering from these DSOs. And that's what you always talk about the new generation. Like there's got to be a new generation. And, uh, I mean, that would, that's just, I, I don't know. I, I would love to hear what you guys, I mean, look, I, I think there, there's gotta be a better way. And there, no, I mean, there does have to be a better way, but like, look, the fastest way to get out of debt is to learn how to produce your ass off like period and own. In any ecosystem you're in, whether it's DSO, whatever. So you like, don't, don't, if you're, if you're saying to yourself like, okay, I'm going to graduate and be a dentist and I'm going to make $120,000 a year for the rest of my life. Like you'll probably have that debt up into retirement, like quite honestly, because you're not going to be able to make massive, massive payments. I mean, I don't know what your lifestyle would be like, but it would be hard. So you have to find a way to literally be producing into the seven figure range right. um, in and order to have that discretionary income to be able to deploy back to your debt. That's, that's, that's my take. Kevin, what do you keep saying in owning? What are you saying in owning what? I said in owning, I feel like can get you that freedom quicker. And I don't want to, I, I, like I said, I, the reason I came on here, I'm, I'm not the expert. I'm not the authority, but I, I know that owning is hard, but is it impossible for someone who knows nothing about business to learn it all? Like, I feel like you can put the time in, you can put the effort in and learn it. And, and it, that is so much more worth it to you, but it, we're not hearing that. It's a different skill set, though. You can be a phenomenal producer and fail in owning a dental practice. You can, you know, you could, that can actually happen. Um, Pete and I have friends that have, have gone through that. Um, so it just depends on, you know, I don't believe that everybody should be an owner. I really don't. I really, really don't. Um, and and it, there's, there's examples to show that. So it's got it. You've got to see, I wouldn't do it just for money. So if you're like the, the best way to make money is to own, I wouldn't necessarily adopt that strategy. I really wouldn't. Cause you could, like, I know associates that make seven fake, they make over a million yeah. dollars a year. Yeah. Like, and I know take, guys take that, home, Kevin. Right. Right. That, that blows my mind. I, so like, don't think that they're not ownership and making a lot of money are not exclusive with one another. There are, you can, there are ways to make a lot of money uh, without having to be ownership. So don't think that that's yeah. and all the time that you, 
all the time that you spend on your business takes you away from the practice and the patient. So if you have the right infrastructure with a partnership, like in Pete's office, Pete, Pete's wheelhouse, he has functional ownership, his, his, his wheelhouse is creating marketing and creating new patient flow. If you step into his infrastructure, you would be, your business would be vastly improved. And all you could have to do is focus on the, the actual practicing of the dentistry, which can, you know, then hundred percent of your time is allocated to that. So I, I don't think that you can just paint with such a broad brushstroke and say that ownership is the quickest way to make a lot of money. You can get your no. tail caught in a crack. No, for sure. Okay. And that's yeah, I think, the thing. I think, I think it is right for me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it, but um, yeah. And I don't, I, and that's the thing. I don't, I don't try to beat my, beat my friends down with that, but I feel like that's how I personally feel. And they're like, there's just that there's yeah. something else. There's, there's all these different options. And that's, I guess the next point to keep it on is that just knowing what the options are in general, uh, you know, are, what is, what is available to you? I mean, you, you two have done two totally crazy things that, like you said, like 15, 20 or 10, 15 years ago, if you told new grads that this was an option, you've told Dennis that was going to be a thing. No one would believe you. Um, and so I feel like just, just letting people know there are other options. I personally don't know what all of them are, but here we have two right here that, uh, that are a great Testament. And I mean, like you were saying about the associateship, you uh, Dr. Bolden, your associates make so much more money. There's no, that, that's sorry, my, I mean, look, I'm not, I, I said, I know of them who do make like massive money. And so we just well, don't, one of mine just told me yesterday, he's been with me for a couple months now. And he's like, he just told me yesterday in the past, he's like, dude, I produced a hundred grand the last three months I've been here. My office that I used to own entirely with its hygiene and part-time specialist never did that. So, you know, if he's doing that and has, you know, so that's, it just, it's just depends on what you want. But I, one thing I would caution is it should just be about the money. You know, money is a very poor motivator. And um, the idea to, to there, there's, there's so many factors that go into it. If you're, if the reason why you want to own the practice is because you want to do it differently, or you, you feel like you want to explore the, the leadership and business talents that you have innately or you want to learn in that domain that's really cool but as you're coming out there's so much dentistry you need to learn too you know after your four years of schooling especially if you don't do a residency man you're super green you don't even know what you don't know you know so you one, think one i need thing, to learn one last thing let's put a bookmark in this and let you go to your next question um and i think it's important because this is what almost wore me out is that i was told i was going to make this much money in dental school i've told this story before you you know you're going to make $120,000 because you're not a specialist. You're not on top of your class. You're not going to be there. You're just going to, you know, you're just going to do this. And if someone had pulled me aside and said, Hey, here's the deal. Once you graduate, there's no freaking limit and there are no rules. Just get out of here and go do you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're not hearing that. that. That's. And so that, <coughs> so I want that to be the, the ending message because if I had been told that, like, I just thought it was almost like these, this artificial glass ceilings that, that my instructors or someone had put yeah. up in society. And I didn't know that like, wait a second, there's no, there's no limit on what I can do. I can have a hundred practices. Yeah. I can, have, I can do not, you know, so it's up to you. And so, it, so I think that needs to be just the, the narrative. There's no rules yeah. and there are no limits to what you can do. I mean, they're telling you not only what to do, but how to think. And people believe the self-imposed limitations that they're put on, but put our, on them. I remember so many of those on me as well. Like even everybody told me the idea was bad that I had, it would never work and I'm crazy. And I remember when we got certified for sedation, the oral surgeon that was the regional supervisor was like, he walks in, he was like, what did you do? I was like, what do you mean? What did I do? He's like, what did you do to your family? What did you do? Like, this was so stupid. Like, you're never going to make it. He was just shocked. He was shocked at what wow. I did. He was literally walking around like, what have you done? Like I've done something so terrible. And I, I was, there was so much of that. It's just people projecting their own self. Yeah. It, it's hard not to, yeah, you hear these other people and, you, and that's, you know, especially on forums. And this is where I know, I guess, question is like what to believe on, you know, how much do you buy into what someone says on Facebook on, on dental town and stuff like that? Because uh, I, I heard, you know, this is what kind of drove me into really digging into dental business is I, I had four private conversations with four successful uh, business owners. And they each told me like, well, you can't have any more than three practices. Three is the number. It's too much. And then another one said five practices is where it stops becoming worth it. It's too much of a hassle. And someone said, I did seven, backed up and did six, then figured out that seven is the right number. And then I'm like, okay, sounds like these people all found out their own, their own, you know, 
their limit. own comfort zone, their own limit. And, and they're yeah. just like telling and you, you this is the rule. And, and you will and, too. And, and they know. told Papa John that he should only open up three pizza restaurants too, by the way. Yeah, and look where he's he got to 50. Look. They told him 50. it's never been done before. So, All right, what's next? What's the other question? Uh, so yeah, so I guess, okay. So uh, you talk about super GPs on here a lot um, and, and that being the future, I, I think that's great. In terms of like what is possible, uh, how, how realistic do you think it is to be, uh, to be able to go out, graduate, not go to a specialty program or residency, um, but kind of position yourself as, as a pseudo specialist of sorts? To go, is that... Do you want me to take it? Greg? Yeah, yeah, take it. I think, I think it's super feasible. Here's the here's why I think this. And and it's, look, there's a place for specialists, and I don't want to get on that. Like, there's no place for specialists. It should all be super GP. And and I don't think I don't think a GP should try and say that like I'm an expert at everything. Like, there's still the, the space for you're great at root canals, and that's what you want to like kind of do a super GP ish plan. Then go towards that. But don't try and do all things to all people, right? For every case, like don't hog your case flow. But I think, I think with technology, I think it's going to be the great disruptor. I, you know, I'm watching the guided implants and the cases that are designed digitally, and and you know, with the advent of just technology and speed, is going to disrupt all of this. And so there are going to be those challenging cases where you're still going to need to refer to an oral surgeon, or you're still going to need to refer to a periodontist. But but I think that the cases in which you're going to feel comfortable handling is going to get more and more and more because you're going to have access to information from a, from a cone beam, from a digital scan, from, from um, you know, intraoral digital scanning to overlaying that to then creating surgical stents to actually reverse engineering or smile designs. Like it's going to get less risky to actually take on cases because you're doing a lot more planning in the beginning. So I am a big fan of technology being the great equalizer. I am too, but I also, we're, we're stepping over something that we, we've done a ton of, and Pete and I have spent in new, like just crazy amounts of continuing education time and money. And I think from this vantage point we're sitting at now after, you know, practicing for as many, as long as we have, that's one thing that you, you've got to appreciate that you really don't have a very good working understanding of dentistry, just newly minted dentists coming out of school. And if you're, if your heart, if you get more fired up over the entrepreneurial endeavors in dentistry than going to like the Spear or Coist Continuum, I would pay attention to that. You, you don't necessarily have to practice even one day. You could actually go out and some of the most iconic um, people that we know in dentistry that have owned, you know, tens or even 100 practices, they had a very limited clinical understanding. So, you know, the, the trajectory that I tell most dentists coming out of school is master your craft first before you really focus on the business because that that's the rate limiting step. You could be an amazing business person, but if you want to be a clinical dentist, that's where you have to invest in first. I think that's what Pete and I did, but to our detriment too, because you spend the first 10 years learning all your CE, you become really good at it. And then you become a victim of your own success. You can't afford to step back from the chair and you have to pivot. So a lot of the very successful DSO heads that I've come to, they, they only practice for a year or less. They don't, they don't have the skill sets that Pete and I have. They never get, went through that. I think, uh, well, at Creighton, at least we don't have any specialty programs here to take away, to poach away our, our cases. So like we get to place implants, we get to do molar endo, we get to oh, do a lot, awesome. of, uh, a lot of surgeries that, that a lot of other schools don't get to do. Uh, but at the same time, then I guess kind of leading into the next question is, is how do you get from, from new grad to, to that spot? And I guess you're saying it's CE now. This is kind of a, a, a trick question or a tricky question. Um, do you, you said you took all the CE. Is there any you regret? Do you think that there were some that were a waste of your time in terms of oh, yeah. why did I try? Obviously, there's the ones that try to sell you stuff. But are there some that you just went to and you're like, why did I try to spread myself so thin and learn everything about occlusion and everything about this and everything about that? Did you feel like you maybe took CE in too broad a scope or, or do you think that's that was the key to your success? Well, for me, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew that my narrow lane was going to be cosmetics and smile designs. And that was it. So almost, if you look at my like transcript of the 20 years of the stuff I've taken, it's, it's very, very narrow focused. So again, I was self-aware enough to know that I didn't like root canals. I've done, I've done one extraction post dental school to, wow. to date, Kevin. Wow. And even that one got a dry socket. 
Well, imagine, of course it did. Right. I, I, I spent so long with it and I mean, it was the most beautiful extraction I thought ever. And I was like, it didn't even bleed. This is amazing. Like, I'm so great. Like, yeah, like my dumb ass didn't even like cure it. And anyway, so my point is, is that I was able to identify the things I didn't want to do. And I, and I went hard towards the things I did because uh, I knew that surgical was going to be a weakness. I was never good at that in dental school. Um, you know, I hated root canals. Like I said, I didn't like working on children. So like, I knew that I had a narrow path of, and I doubled and tripled down on my, what I thought were my God given strengths, which was being more artistic. And so that's, that's kind of my story. So I think, I think where a school like yours, where it's, where you're able to kind of be exposed to some things and be like, Hmm, I like this. Uh, but I really hate that. I would keep unpacking that as much as possible while you're in the shelter of your school. Because then when you get out and you'll see it in the real world, then you can, then you can deploy your limited resources after you pay your student debt down, you can deploy towards continuums and, and extended CE because that's part of the process. Like you're not, you're still going to have to invest in yourself post dental school. I want oh that to make sure that's known. I was talking to a, a mutual friend of Pete and I, is that he's been out for four years at a school and I was talking to him just a couple of weeks ago and he said he spent $55,000 on CE and I'm like, wow, over two year period. He's like, no, one year. So this guy is a big Instagram influencer and everybody's following him. But I mean, you get rewarded in public for what you're doing in private. So all these success stories, there's people just working. Their and unfortunately, ass. that's a very smart thing to do. And I say unfortunately, because that's like, Kevin, you probably heard that it was like 50 grand after dental school. After 55, like, one okay. year. No, but that's just one year. He's doing that every year. Yeah, but insane. it's really the smartest thing ever, right? The earlier you can do that, the more, from a return on investment standpoint, the yeah. more it will, the more it will compound. Locking your earning it's potential. Effect. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. doing full arches now. So. Well, that's great. So, but you know, <sighs> full arch implants. So I think so. that's important to say is that there should be, you should actually be comfortable with establish a rate, reverse engineer all of your, once you get in, out of school, reverse engineer all of your earnings and like what you're willing to deploy back towards continuing education. I think that's a good thing. And it may be $20,000 a year, maybe 10. It may be free. There's a bunch of opportunities for a lot of free good CE, you know, <laughs> like video based, like implant compare. My friend Blake McClellan runs something that, you know, you can or spear online is awesome to watch. Yeah. You can watch surgeries, like full blown surgeries, ask questions like you're there. Like stuff like that, we didn't have. I had to go to you know twenty five thousand dollar implant continuums to, yeah, we had to learn. fly to freaking Arizona, and there was nothing. I mean, and the consultants were all. That was the big thing that I wasted a lot of money and time Consultant. on. Was consultants, yeah, guys that have no chops that don't belong in the space. They've never owned a practice. They never worked in one. Yet they're pontificating about how to run it. I don't know. Well, it, uh, but you, but you do have a consultant. You both have consultants, no? No, at the moment, no. No. Oh, right. Yeah, Pete's my consultant. I'm his. Um, yeah, it, we, we, we coined a, a phrase from last, yeah, just last podcast, which is, what was it, Craig? What did oh, it? God, I, I said I was going to steal it. No, oh, been, been there, there didn't haven't do, done that. Been there, haven't done that. And literally, that's oh, unfortunately, geez. there's a lot of folks teaching on how to do, yet they've never done. And I think that's a little bit hypocritical. Yeah, yeah, you talk about how to build this practice with such and such a cash flow and such and size, and they have practices that are maybe doing four hundred grand top line and not even netting out to pay the bills. Well, let's tell you guys said you both fell victim to that. So, so how do you uh, how do you advise, um, you know, not getting poached off by by someone trying to trying to take advantage of that? Study, uh, I think study clubs are good. And here's why I say that because you want to be able to bounce this off and you want to be able to talk to people who have literally th that you trust that aren't affiliated with any kind of um, compensation on the back end for them to, to refer to you. Like you want some transparent referral saying, yeah, it was a good investment. I spent 50,000 on this, on this consultant for the practice a year, but I, you know, my practice went up 500,000 or you want to get real life examples from people who are not plugged by that consultant firm to tell, talk to you. Right. Gotcha. Half. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And listen, I mean, just, just availing yourself of podcasts is incredible. We, I, we had we no didn't have that. We didn't we have that. Know. We didn't have, yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. crazy the amount. Everything was, you had to go to a seminar, you had to go to a uh, ADA convention and there was no, there was no chat room or review system or form of vetting what's going on. Now you can just go on Facebook on one of the, you know, Cool. And, and, and Kevin, one thing too is like, there's no, there's no shortage of a lot of mentors out there. Like I didn't leverage that as much as I should. I had a couple getting out of school, but like, 
a lot of the things that you that, that people think they need that they need consultants for could easily be a free mentor because there's a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of guys and gals out there who would love to help out a younger dentist and pay it forward a little bit, but aren't but aren't charging for it. They just you know they want to give back because they've received so much, and and I think that's something that that I would I would recommend to all of your classmates find someone that 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 has the bandwidth number one to give back time to them and answer questions like you are. Um, but find someone that you want to be like, right? The quickest way to, you know, the quickest way to kind of getting the path that you want is finding someone who's already done it. Right. I mean, that's right? why I reached out to you guys, but. <laughs> well, thank you. That's kind of you. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, and uh, going to uh, what you said, Craig, about uh, there is so much information and it's great. And I try to, uh, I, I love it. I feel like I get, it, it gets me fired up about dentistry uh, clinically and, and from a business standpoint, all these podcasts and stuff like that. And the Facebook groups, are, there's some good ones or some bad ones and, and not, to, not to be the uh, typical complaining millennial, but there's almost too much and sorting through that is difficult. And you listen to, you know, four hours of podcast and be like, wow, okay, there's really nothing to gain here. And then I feel like sometimes a lot of people be like, oh, I listened to this one, but I didn't really get anything out or I read XYZ book and I didn't really get anything out of that. This Facebook group I was in, they seem like it's, it's trash. So just like, be careful like, of the zero sum game. And you're going to see this all in your profession, Kevin, which a lot of dentists do for some reason. And it's like, if, if, if someone sees you're winning, it means that they must be losing, right? It, it, like they don't, that's not this abundant mentality. And, and so sometimes people don't like to see others do better. It's the crab pot. Like you're doing well, let me pull you down. Let me just talk yeah. shit about you and say, you're not doing good care, all this stuff. That. So unfortunately be careful of online forums because trolls are pervasive in just social yeah. media they're pervasive everybody's in. nine feet tall behind this yeah computer. like and like look, look at how much and like and so i would just be careful with getting on online forums that and just like throwing in your two cents because what's your upside with that right, right. and i see so many dentists <clears throat> wasting so much time like back in the day here let me give you an example really how old i am so we had this we had i was a part of this group called generation next which then morphed into something called the Academy of Comprehensive Aesthetics. And the only communication we had, there wasn't online forum with Facebook. We were on a email list. So you would get every email from every member talk like that was the dialogue. And I would see these gentlemen and gals literally on there all day long. What do you think about this? What about this? What about this? And it was all day long, this banter back and forth. And I'm saying, you know, y'all, and then they would, in other side of their mouth, complain about not having a great practice and not having good production. I said, if you were, if you were just, applying what you were doing and utilizing your, your bandwidth here into your practice and learning how to grow your business, you, you know, it wouldn't have this issue, but like, so be careful. My point is, is that social media forums, everything can be a black hole and it can suck you in and it can detract you. And, and at, at some point you just need to go execute and you need to stay away from these things that are going to take away your time because everything is going to try. Right. And be careful where you put your energy into because you will, become like there, there is there's a vibe and a culture and all the different Facebook um, chat rooms like I just I've really pulled myself off of the a lot of those because it's like dentistry sucks and like you know there's this one group I won't name the names but it's just like how poor of an investment dentistry is and how no one would advise going into it and I was the one person that's like that's bullshit like I'm happy and then I was like oh of course you're happy you got Tony Robbins your patient and blah 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 you have a big building and yeah but and, you had to my point is, you're making my point you had to you you chimed in to try and be valuable and try right. and be a voice of reason and I just all got people sand kicked my you. face and then you had to spend massive amounts of time defending your position and you made how no. much dollars from that, Craig? None, none how, whatsoever. How and, much, did your family get better because of that? <clears throat> no. And did I'm your business to, get stronger? No. no. And, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to talk to the Kevin Reardon's out there that are just listening to that vile crap. That's just total bullshit. I mean, what I did, and, and I think this might be helpful for you too, Kevin, is get your dental education from rock star clinicians and look for business inspiration from inspirational business people. Read That's Richard great. Branson, read Howard Schultz, read Howard, uh, Tony Shea from Zappos. Those guys are big, big thinkers. And somehow, in some way, being a masterful dentist is about a myopic focus because your success and failure is in a fraction of a millimeter. But being a masterful business owner is in the macro at the 30,000. So right. sometimes you get in your own way because you're so micro millimeter focused, you can't get out of your own fucking way and see the big picture. So I would in the initial that is great advice. Craig. I would init. Thank you. That is great advice. That's what I do. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I would, I would, um, I would go in 
find some clinical mentors, and then get the biggest freaking thinkers in business, the Bransons, the Tony Robbins, the uh, Simon Sinek's, the yeah. Gary V's, and eat that shit up. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because these guys are pontificating, going off of their own bullshit, and they, they don't have self-esteem. Like Some guys are even bragging about that they charge so little. Like, oh, in my office, it's that much. And they make excuses. I remember I gave an Invisalign lecture on the west coast of Florida a long time ago, seven years ago. Actually, a guy that works with me now, Dr. Uh, Alfredo, he was attending that lecture seven years ago. And I remember I was talking about Invisalign, how to grow your practice into an elite Invisalign practice. And one of the girls stood up and or raised her hand and said, you know, I know this works in your backyard, but we practice here and people don't have that type of discretionary income to drop four or five grand in Invisalign. And I remember I drove in early that morning and I said, well, you know, hey, doc, where, where, where do you practice? You practice this way or that way? Well, no, I practice down that road. I'm like, on oh, the road we drove in on? She's like, yeah. I was like, isn't that, a, isn't that a brand new like car dealership going in? She's like, yeah. I'm like, well, what kind of car dealership is that? She's like, that's a Mercedes Benz dealership. I'm like, well, don't you think Mercedes Benz of North America has done a shit ton of demographic research to realize that the people in that area can afford a Mercedes? But yet the dialogue she chose to believe was that my area, they can't afford that. And you can never exceed the expectations you place on yourself. So if you believe that this cannot work, it can't work. And all of the limitations are self-imposed. I mean, so you got it. You, you got to. I'm you gotta, ready to run through a brick wall. I'm, I'm well, totally on board with that. <laughs> well, it's just you've got it. You've got life. Life is not a process of self-discovery. It's a process of self-creation. You've got to make Doctor Reardon into what he's supposed to be. I don't know. I, I haven't figured out what he's supposed to be yet. But maybe he's going to be the massive dental entrepreneur that rolls out. Uh, you know what what dentistry needs, or maybe he's going to be a masterful clinician. But trying to ride both horses at the same time, especially this early in your career, is gonna be hard. So my unsolicited advice would probably be create a three-year vision and figure out what it's gonna look like after three years. Personally for me, I know Peter believes in this as well because all the docs he hires are graduates of advanced dental training day one. He, He nor I will hire a green dental guy right out of school. Like Peter's getting these two-year GPRs. I would require at least one-year GPR, some work experience. And I know corporate's a cool place that you could do that, but they're not going to teach you much more than speed, perhaps. Mm-hmm. I'm a big proponent of a GPR. I really am. I didn't do one. Pete didn't do one. But I think that would have probably saved us a year. You know, the year we spent could have, you know, that really boosts you. And, and mm-hmm. be a voracious, uh, have a voracious appetite for CE, whether it's Kois, Coke, it's Spear, one of the big occlusion guys, because everything's built on occlusion, whether it's aesthetics or implants or anything, occlusion is the thing you don't understand just yet. <clears throat> so that would be my advice. And then as you're doing that dual track by just consuming amazing business people and the most iconic business people around are such abundant thinkers. They constantly say, why not? Why not? And the dentists on Facebook, are, I'll it's tell so you, opposite. It's literally I'll tell you why not. I tell you why not. They've got all the answers. You ask yeah. Richard Branson, you sit down with Richard Branson, he's going to get curious. You know, uh-huh. he's going to be like, yeah, that's interesting. Why not? Why not? Yeah, I wonder. Howard Schultz from Starbucks is like, why don't we have cafes in America? Dentists would have told him because no one likes cafes here. They, they don't work. But these are big thinkers. So don't limit your – don't limit advice. Yeah, I think being a, being a big picture guy, it recently like just trying to distance myself from that negativity on the, the forums and whatnot – I think that's just been the most beneficial and just getting myself worrying and, and, and reeling and ready to go. Um, I know the GPR thing, like, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like that's the biggest, I think that'll be the next thing. And I'm, I'm happy to, to share this. I hope, I hope I would love for Heartland to hear this and just turn around and implement it, but there's gotta be an associateship. I feel like that, that takes a GPR that doesn't pay you any money and an associateship and just kind of makes it like, hey, you can, you can have this little mini curriculum of CE with this mentor and turn it into something yep. where you're kind of just making a factory. And I feel Pete's like doing it. I, I, Pete, I, I get so doing? frustrated. I, I, I hear all these things and I'm like, shit, if I'm going to have to be the one that does it, I'll do it. But why isn't someone else doing it? And why is everyone telling me that it can't work? It, it really just, it, it, it gets me really angry. Well, and, don't, I, I, wanna, I don't want to hijack this because Pete's actually doing what you just said. But you, one thing you will always get is there's an Albert Einstein quote, which I love. It says, um, uh, great thinkers will, uh, will, great thinkers will attract violent opposition from mediocre minds. It's just, no matter what you do, there's going to be tons of people just tearing you down and trying to tell you you can't do it. 
I had a very uh, inspirational person that I had a chance to spend some time with. He said, people are symbols, you're a symbol. So people hate symbols, people love symbols, but what your success or your drive is doing is highlighting their lack of success and their lack of drive. So when you come out, this young buck, D3, a third year dental student, you're like, I wanna take over the world, and then this other guy's 45 years old and he didn't take over the world, you actually upset him because you're the one who highlights what he hasn't done. Mm -hmm. So he's gonna get really amped up because you're a symbol to what he could have been and what he could have done. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it has nothing to do with you. If you'll live right. by people's criticism, you'll die by their, I mean, you live by their praise, you'll die by their criticism. You're right. always gonna get people yeah. that think you're great, people that think you suck. I get people that I see stuff on the Facebook chat, like, oh, bulletproof, you know, yeah, whatever. Like, it's all about the money. And it's, they don't know me. They don't know, no one, no one knows who you oh, really, really are. Oh, really, you see that? I don't even, see, I don't oh, even know. Yeah, man, I'm I'm a, even I know. saw Mr. this thing. Craig, no one That's knows. Hilarious. No one, no one knows, no one knows. And at the end of the day, you have to live by your own principles and do what's right. And people are gonna hate you that don't know you. And I remember go, walking, meeting somebody once recently in a dental practice and they remarked, they, they were thinking, but they actually spoke as I was talking to them like, wow, you're actually nice. And I was like, well, what, do you, what do you mean I'm nice? Like, uh, what, like I just thought you'd be so rude. And I'm like, well, how? I, it was just amazing that they had this whole idea of who I was or who I wasn't. And the opposite happens. Like, oh, you're so amazing. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, either, I'm not either one. It's just I'm a symbol for something and you're a symbol for something as well. And you're, you're getting people's reaction to some energetic young guy. But I don't want to take away from Pete. Pete, tell them what you're doing with the, um, with yeah, the, the GPR. Well, <clears throat> so I, yes. Yeah, so I basically did exactly what you said, Kevin. I gave someone an opportunity to do a second year GPR at my facility. And it wasn't so much... It, number one, this, this gentleman was so impressive that I wanted to make sure that he was part of my organization. Um, but he also said he was also frustrated because the GPR program wasn't doing well for him at the time. And, and so we have enough uh, amazing clinicians in my organization that I said, look, what, is a, what does a GPR pay you? He told me, and I was like, come on board with us. I'll pay you the same amount. You'll have a better lifestyle. You'll be able to actually learn some skills and, and you can dive deep into stuff that's going to be transformative in dentistry, the digital dentistry, the, you know, designing smiles, you know, surgical guides, like le literally learning from the pros. Right. That's awesome. And, you know, and I think, I, I think he would, would, if he's on this podcast, he would, he would say it was probably the best decision I've made because, you know, he's getting, getting a head start for seeing how it's really done. And it's really going from learning, learning, learning like X level stuff inside of a GPR that's really, he's, you know, he'll probably end up working for us. Uh, I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I hadn't even thought the fact that he might not work for us actually. Um, <laughs> but I, but I see him as a long term because we gave him an opportunity, but so I, I don't know if that's a direct parallel to what you were kind of talking yeah, about. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it essentially is it, either way. I, you know, it's still, I, I'm a D3. I've got time to, to think these things over and plan more out, but really, I guess just, you know, I've got these big ideas and yeah, like you said, trying to change the world or whatever. And, you know, once I accepted that, I may not change the world. And if I don't, that's not going to be a failure. Like if I have these huge ideas and I only end up making a change in Elmhurst, Illinois, or, and the three surrounding suburbs right next door, that's better than not, like, that's not a failure in my mind. And so, uh, but, but like you said, it, until, you know, I, I'm not going to accept, you know, other people's, other people's violent opposition to me. And if, and if you're doing, if you're doing something like that already, that's just testament to the fact that, uh, that I can do what I think I can do. Um, yeah. And just be careful of your time. Like, as I'm saying, I think that like, that was my point. It isn't so much just like, sometimes I get in conversations. And I'm like, okay, where's my upside in this? Because you're just going to challenge me and leave with the same thing that you left coming in. And like, like, where's my upside in this? Like, I'm going to spend a half hour talking about nothing. Then we're yeah. just going to walk away disagreeing. Right. And that's it's what happens People online. That. Time is, but in a half hour, Kevin, what could I have done for my, what could I have provided for, for my family? How much, you know, like, answer well, that. I think it's, I think, listen, the, you don't know the ROI of your time and you help somebody. Yes, you do. You help, well, listen, you help one person. I do. Okay. You help, you help one person and you've done a massive service to humanity. Or to that's a difference. That's a difference. I, but, but you got to understand the difference is, is that people build an emotional home and once they get their, he their heels dug into this concept, like dentistry sucks, or you have to go corporate or you have to do this, 
what you're doing is you, you're not actually asking the questions. You're challenging their emotional stable home and they don't want to ruffle that shit up. So they, you're, you're, you're searching for inspiration in the wrong spot. Yeah, but, but if you're ruffling it up with something, and this is another, like one of my things, if you're ruffling it up with something like service and incorporating that into the, the, the pillars of your organization, like you almost can't get that up. Like you can't, no one wants to be the guy saying, Oh no, well you can't give away shoes to people every time they buy a pair of shoes. No one wants to say you can't go do Free dental, like, no one's going to be that angry voice saying that that well, can happen. So they I feel do. like they do. They will. <laughs> they will. Well, I, I just feel like if, if you have that, then you can just the buy in from, from your own employees from like, I would love like what uh, I guess I'll ask you on air. This is a question I guess people would have and, and put you on the spot sort of like you, you know, you did that awesome thing with John Carlos Stanton, obviously getting to know him. There's no play by play on how to, how to, how to network with the best you know, athlete of all time in the, in his sport, but, um, but how do you get there? How do you start, how well, do you start something like that? How do you, in terms of service wise, how do you, how do you just take the leap and start doing well, something? Listen, I can't, I don't know, you know, I know I'm just dropping a whole bunch of cliches here, but Steve Jobs was famous for saying that you can't connect the dots going forward. You can only connect them going backwards, like how it all happened. So way before John Carlos Stanton ever showed up, we created a core value to be charitable. Um, and we were smacking nails into roofs on houses for uh, Habitat for Humanity builds. And that was really stupid because we were building houses for people who had tooth pain. And, you know, it's a bunch of dentists smacking nails into a roof. That's really just a gross misappropriation of our talents and resources. So we started doing free dental days. And while John Carlo was here, he was sent from a friend who had seen me lecture out in L.A., I believe. And while he was here, we were milling a, a bridge for him because he got hit in the face with that 95 right. mile an hour fastball. And I had like four hours downtime with him. So I was just showing him who we are, not for any other reason, but you know, we, we have core values and we do things. I showed him what we do. And then six or eight months later, he gets inks that deal for 325 million. And I also didn't post about him. So, right, right. you know, one business 101, Pete and I will tell you, if you come to our summit is try to get Instagram influencers to post about you. He was embarrassed about his injury. He looked like crap. He looked like you know, all of his teeth were knocked out. And I didn't want to violate his privacy. We, I just created a really good bond with him, and I didn't post anything about it. Meanwhile, it was all over the papers. Dental injury, John Carlos Stanton, and they never did anything. But that was one of the greatest things that ever happened. Actually, I felt stupid about it because the, the publicity went away. And after a while, I'm like, shit, I should have posted about chance, that. Yeah. It would have been such a – it was my chance. And I get this call over Christmas break from his agent – and I was like, hey, listen, we were watching you. We really appreciate that you didn't post about it. You didn't do anything with it. And John Carlo doesn't trust many people, but he trusts you now because he did that. And he wants to start a charity with you, anything you want to do. And so how would I have told you how to do that? I don't know. I, but, you know, God has a plan for all of us. And I think that you do the right thing for the right reasons at the right time. And the timing is just going to show up. And even though you're going through every challenge you have has something you'll learn from it. I know it sounds really woo-woo, but that's a good life lesson. You do it for the right reasons. Had I done it, like I am going to go out and call John Carlos Stanton, start a charity, right. been totally inauthentic. He would have sniffed that shit out and not wanted to do anything. So I but was, did you, did you reverse engine? I mean, obviously that, you know, reverse engineering, yeah, you know, a lot about that. Were you thinking eventually we're going to grow into this big thing? Or were you just thinking, were you thinking kind of, if we just start and take the leap and start doing good, it could grow into something bigger. Is that I think doing good has a universal law to it. What you do, what you do, that's good. That comes, just comes back to you. I mean, it's the same reason we, Pete and I wrote a book when we wrote the book, the guy who, the ghostwriter who helped us was like, well, what are you trying to sell? And when Pete and I had a moment of uncomfortable silence, it's actually, we're not trying to sell anything. The guy was just like completely dumbfounded. He's like, you're writing a book yeah, and not going to sell shit. We're like, no, we want to pay it forward. So I just think that, you know, you can't just do it with expectation. One thing that I've done is sometimes even though I do good, I have this little thing in me. And I think we all do if we admit, if we look deep inside of ourselves, we all sometimes just have this expectation that I'll do good and people will like me or someone will like me more or something will happen for it. You can't do that because then you're really not doing good. You're doing business, get, doing something and, get, and expecting something to get in return is business. And you got to really be clear about it. You just do good because something else is going to come from it. And that's how John Carlo happened. And even with Tony Robbins, the same thing, like, you know, that was, that meeting was just fortuitous and from a product of me just doing good. And I, you know, 
it wasn't like anything else. Like there wasn't a business arrangement around it. Right. That's my recipe. I think, you know, there's other recipes how to be more strategic around it. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. Cause I, that's with the big thing. Uh, uh, and I guess kind of a recurring theme is like, what is possible? And if, if this is possible, what's the way to get there? And obviously you guys don't have all the answers. Um, but I appreciate you, uh, clearing some of them up and clarifying your takes on them because, uh, you, you know, one or two people's takes who have done something in the industry is a lot better than, uh, than the same path we've been hearing and also a lot better than just the negativity that you get a lot of. So, uh, this is yeah, definitely tune that also. crap out, man, please do yourself yeah. a favor and tune that out. You got to tune that out. That'll drown you. That'll set your, that'll set your course. And sometimes people being told they can't do it actually fires them up. I know Pete, Pete has had some experiences where he's been told like, I'll run you out of this town and this is the worst thing in your life. And Pete's like, all right, let's get it on. So you can use that as fuel too sometimes. Right. All right. Well, what else do I have there? I mean, the other Pete. questions I have. Pete, you there? I'm here. All right. Pete's just I'm taking just notes. Letting you pontificate. All right. Oh, he's gonna, that means he's going to edit all this out, by the way. All right. <laughs> um, hey, what happened to Craig I mean, today? He was that... on the show. <laughs> yeah, he was talking for a second. You could, like, you could uh, do like an audio effect of laryngitis on me. He lost Just his voice. As well. What uh, uh, other things, you know, people worry about is, and I, I, this kind of plays into the mentorship, but um, the, the little things like, uh, do I need to use a Facebo and do I need to do pin retain buildups and those type of things? I understand. I mean, those are the two obvious that you guys are laughing. Like, uh, you know, we, well, it's just not a good use of our, 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 we shouldn't be talking about that. There's a myriad of resources for you. Yeah. Company. Right. Exactly. And that's just, you find through mentors and just through doing it yourself. I feel like. Yeah. I think that's important. I mean, listen, there's, there's so many resources and they're all good. I mean, Panky, Dawson, Coyce. I mean, there's just so many, right Pete? hundred yeah. percent. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't, you don't need to hear our clinical philosophies on stuff. Right. So, I mean, right. like Greg's saying, there's people who that's been their whole life is educating. Yeah. I agree. Coys, Coys, Spanky, Spear, uh, all those, like they, they're the ones to teach you that stuff. Not, and don't worry about which one they're all freaking awesome. Yeah. yeah. And those are, those are like the two, those are the questions that you're most at, at these, you know, as the meetings and, and conferences and stuff like that is like, what's if you could what's the, the number one ce course you took and i i feel like it's kind of a it's a yeah i mean at this point i think you need it um you need that you, right out of school i think you need it you don't know what you don't know it's important to get that stuff well kevin i don't want to take up too much of your time i hope that was uh valuable for you no that was that was awesome i, I, I guess i went I, off I on a tangent for a second but no it was great love that i don't know if peter loved it but it's all right of course I loved it. I did love it. You know, I, I think in closing, I think the one thing I want, want to impress upon is that like, there's a, there's a phrase in the, the, the tech space. And I love that they say this because in dentistry, we we're the complete opposite. It is, and it's um, move fast and break things. Right. And it basically means like, you're going it, to, it's, it's okay to make mistakes. There's going to be a lot of stuff that fails. Let's, the faster route we can fix it, that this is not the faster we can figure out that this is not, the correct path is the is is you know it's just going to accelerate us into what what is the right path and so i think one of the the things that that helped me in my career it was that i was i was okay making mistakes and i, I really considered it being accelerated learning and i studied marketing and i failed in marketing i studied clinical and i failed in clinical but i got back on the horse and i think i see a lot of colleagues um that play it really safe um, and I'm not saying that one should be belligerent with their decisions, especially when they have a lot of people depending on them, but, but the fruit is the greatest on the limb out on the limb. And, and that's the truth. And you, and if you play it safe your entire life, it might be one filled with regret. Right. It's, yeah. that's just my personal opinion. Um, and just to, and I see I mean, that. I've still, I've, I've still got to take my board. Like I part two boards. I've still got to get all my clinical requirements in. And well, and, I'm not saying you should use this advice. Right, <laughs> right, now. right. I'm I'm remember that when when you do, because like <laughs> there will be no better investment, Kevin, ever in your life. It won't be real estate. It won't be. It won't be anything. Your best investment is you. Period. Period. Double when you're good at something and you know you're good at something. Double and triple down on you. That's mm -hmm. it. I mean, I think that, Craig, would you agree or no? For sure, for yeah. sure. I really do. And, and just so you know, Pete and I have the, the benefit of 
having this personal relationship as well. And we're having conversations that we, we, we won't go off on a tangent right now, but on stuff that's just totally impossible. We're working on something together <laughs> that is like totally impossible. And everybody that I've talked to about it, I actually have to figure out a way that they just will open their ears because it's so ludicrous that they, they just want to shut it out immediately. So I'm like, we have to call it something different because it's just, it's impossible. All and right, you've convinced me. I'm in. It's our, it's our moonshot. It's our yeah. moonshot, right? But it needs um, to be done and it has such a noble cause that it's like, it doesn't matter how impossible it is, you know? So, I mean, listen, you're just, you're just tuning into the wrong radio station. Get off those dentists uh, filling you with inspiration. They're not there for inspiration. Yeah, and, and instead of going on Facebook, go to YouTube, type in, you know, Gary V, type in Tony Robbins, type in something else. Use those, Simon Sinek. Use those 15 minutes that you were going to be on. The Jeff phone. Bezos, listen to him talk. In this on the dental time. school forum or whatever, like arguing about nothing. Yeah. Get on there and actually spend that 15 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day and be a student. Be a so, student with your spare time. You guys, you know, you, you guys are talking about this moonshot and obviously you, you seem pretty uh, like you're holding back some excitement about it and probably don't want to share it. That's fine. But uh, you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, you kind of just met, you kind of knew of each other and then one of you reached out to the other. Like, how do you, like, when people always tell that, that find your team and surround yourself with the right people and, and find the best people, if you're, if you're the smartest person, blah, 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 all that. But, um, you know, you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, just reached out on a limb to someone that you looked up to and figured, hey, I could learn something from this guy. Maybe we'd make a good team. You just started talking. Is that right? Yeah, but we, we do that. I do that all over the place. And I, I mean, listen, if I get a patient that's just amazing, I'm like, can I take you to lunch? And I'll even joke around. I'm like, it'll be the, you know, I'll buy you a $40 lunch, but I'm just really interested in learning what you did. Anything. And it's not just dentistry. So broaden your focus. You're trying to find an inspirational dentist. There's dentists to teach you dentistry, but inspiration comes in many different shapes and sizes. So that's my, my advice. But Kevin, I can tell though, like, keep, keep being you, man, you're going to win and you're going to do good. Yeah, things for shit. Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I, hope so. I haven't met you in person, but I can, you know, we I, can feel I, your enthusiasm and hunger. Yeah. So keep, keep hustling, man. Don't, don't give up the good fight and just, yeah, you know, dream big for sure. I know that sounds cliche, but really there's remember that I said, there's no rules and there's no limits. Yeah. Right. Well, it'll be a lot cooler when I come back as a guest and, uh, yeah. you guys yeah. are, uh, we're reading off my list of accomplishments. Nice. And, Nice. By, by then, it'll be two different co-hosts of the Bulletproof Dental Practice podcast. We, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, but anyway, Kevin, thanks, thanks for hitting us up. Thanks for coming on. I, uh, I'm going to expect that you're going to be uh, an advocate for distributing this podcast to everyone you know in all of your dental school. <laughs> As much as I can, absolutely. Um, but I enjoyed it, man. I like to give perspective, and I like to hopefully uh, give back as, as like, like Craig does, and that's why we do it. So yep. thank you, pal. And um, yeah, man, if you, ever need, if you ever need us, I know, you know we're available via email. So like you did, just if you have questions going forward, we get not, not on the podcast itself, but you just have questions or, or something you need some clarity on, we're more than glad to help you. Sweet. Thanks so much. Thanks, right, Kevin. You're awesome, that. buddy. No, we're not worried about you, bro. You're going to kick ass. Keep it up.